Have your Bibles turned to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And well, I didn't know I was ministering today and um, until, I guess, late Friday night. And so I just was seeking the Lord. And so I woke up with a little puts on my heart on Saturday morning. And then I had things all day yesterday that was a fundraiser for a missions organization to Indonesia. And it was, it was rough. I got to play golf yesterday. So that was, that was real rough, but it was, it we all went to a good cause. Um, uh, and no, I'm not that good of a golfer. So, uh, and then, so this morning I woke up with some other things that, and put it all together. And because it has to do with it has to do with progressing. My, my assignment over the last times that I've ministered have been all have been about identity. Have you, have you listened to any messages recently about identity? You know, who we are, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we are children of God, that we're sons of God. And we have to be, we have to be conscious of the environment we're living in because the environment that we're living in, when I say the environment, I'm talking about the world we're living in, will constantly try to shape and place us and put labels upon us. And next thing you know, that we're living in this world that's defined labels for us that God didn't label us. And we exalt our label above what God has told us and called us within his word. We have a tendency to exalt worldly labels and not embrace God's labels. And therefore, when we do that, we constantly want to divide ourselves and we constantly put one person against another person when all the fact, when the Bible tells us there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male or female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. So when we understand that and we understand that my identity as a child of God is I'm a son. My identity is, is not who I am no longer in the natural. It's not that I, I, I don't live in this world anymore. The issue is the world doesn't define my future, and it doesn't really define my present. Amen. And so without going through a lot of review in that, I want to I start off here and just get right into this in Romans chapter 12. Verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Meaning, meaning this, is like a, this is like an imperative. This is, I'm imploring you. This is, I'm begging you. This is something that, that Paul is emphatic about. And he's saying, look, I'm coming to you because you need to understand what I'm about to say. I, I'm begging you that, that you get on my level of understanding because you need to come up to a new way of thinking. He goes, so I beseech you by the mercies of God. I'm coming to you because, one, God loves you, and I'm coming to you because I love you. I'm coming to you because, because God doesn't want you down here in a place of discouragement, in a place of torment. He wants you to come up to another way of thinking and another way of living. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself, your body is as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Then he tells us this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's stop there. So he tells us, don't be conformed by this world, but what do we find ourselves doing day in and day out? If we're not careful, we're conforming ourselves to this world. We're conforming ourselves to the world system, the way the world does things. We get into the same arguments and debates the world is getting into. And he tells us not to be conformed to this world. The word conform there is patterned. Patterned. You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my granddaughter over here just, just turned 11 and uh, give a hand to Addie. And, you know, we love Addie. And uh, she, is, she is an actress. Marvelous, I might add. And um, oh, she steals my heart. <laughs> I love you, Addie. Uh, and, um, and so Annette, <laughs> she needed a costume for this, this play. She's coming in. It's going to be in a couple weeks. And so, so Annette, it's like, she just surprised me. All of a sudden she goes, well, I can, I can make her skirt. 
And so she went, in, but she had to do something to make this skirt for this costume. And she had to go get a pattern. And she had to go by the pattern to be able to get the right result. You see, there's the world has a pattern. And it's going to try to fit you and shape you into the mold it wants to shape you. But you know what? It may not be a pattern that God designed for you. If I went the, if I went the way that I wanted to pattern my own life, then I would not be here today. But when I submitted myself to, to one, Jesus, that's the beginning. And then all of a sudden, I then submitted myself to the word. And all of a sudden, now that transforming part is now I'm being transformed. Now I'm being shaped into the pattern that God has for my life, not the way that my life has been going for the previous 20 years. That was my case. Because constantly I had things that were trying to shape me, mold me, alcohol, drugs, disappointment, stealing, all sorts of things that were happening in my life that was shaping me and molding my thought processes. We have to understand, you know, the thought process you, you, you have, contrary to you might you think, the thought process you might have could be wrong. <laughs> Maybe the way that your parents did it wasn't the right way. Maybe your professor might have had some truth, but not all truth. Amen. It's interesting today when we talk about science. You have, there's science and then there's true science. There's, science is different today than science was years ago. Because when you want to operate with true science, then you should always have questions. But today... According to science, if you have questions, you're wrong. <laughs> but yet the world will try to shape us in different molds and, and do all this stuff. But you know what? It's probably not the pattern that God might have for us. You know what? I didn't like the direction I was heading in my life. I didn't like my, the thought processes I, processes I had. And you know what? You can even be born again and, and going to heaven, but yet you still have wrong thought processes. The whole point of getting into the word is so we can, the Bible tells us, so we can grow up into him. Ephesians 4 tells us to, to the, the pastors, prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers were sent for the perfecting of the saints. So they do the work of the ministry that we might grow up into all things to him who is the head, even Christ. That's, that's what the word is for. But if we're not careful, everything else will shape our lives. When all the while Paul's saying, hey, hear this, don't be shaped and be conformed to the direction the world wants to take you. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter one. I'm just laying a foundation here. This all has to do with identity. Deuteronomy chapter one. A number of weeks back when we talked about this, we talked about uh, in this uh, series, we brought out out of Numbers where it talked about how the children of Israel were to go into the promised land. And it said that, he goes, it said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers in our sight and even in their sight. And my question to all of us was, did they have a conversation with them to see actually how they thought about them? No. So that, that, was, that was the perception that we have based on their thinking. Because you have to understand, the Israelites have been slaves for 430 years. You see, you can take someone out of poverty, but can you take poverty out of them? I mean, I mean you, you, throw in, you throw in a million dollars at someone, hey, they'll, lo they'll lose it in a week. Because poverty is not a state of financial, is not a financial position. Poverty is a state of mind. So you can throw money at things all day long, but the issue is people will lose the money because they have a poverty mentality. I can better not get into that now. I'm myself in trouble. 
Deuteronomy chapter 1, let's look at verse 26. It says, nevertheless, you would not go up. Talking about the promised land. You would not go up, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents. You complained in your tents. Some of all, you need to stop complaining at home. (laughs) On what God's not doing, what God hasn't done, or what you thought God did, or what God was the problem. He said, he goes, you, 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 didn't, you didn't do what I told you to do. Instead, you decide to complain about it. He said, you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us. See, so, some of us here even need to get a better mindset of God. You need to get a bigger, better picture of God. They, they said they're complaining in their tents and they say, Phil, God hates us. There's times in my life where I walk through things and I may have never said that out of my mouth, but I thought it. Why is this happening to me? I may not put God in that statement, but ultimately I'm looking at God as the problem. Why did you allow this to happen? And if I really reverse the situation, maybe it started with my choices five years before that. Maybe it had to do with my eating habits for 20 years. Maybe it had to do with neglecting things that I knew God told me to do all along. <laughs> you see, that, that's what we, we have to, we have to stop putting it all on God. A lot of times that's the cop out. You know, people to say, oh, well, God is in control. I think that's one of the worst f- phrases that ever entered into the body of Christ. Well, God is in control. Well, my thing, if you look at the world today, if God's in control, he's really messing up. And people say, well, look at all the hunger and look at all the need. Does it, why doesn't God do something about that? The Bible tells us that God moves where he's sought, not where he's needed. The Lord hates us. If you get to verse 28, it said in there, he said there, um, he said this, he goes, where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged us. Our brethren. See, some of us need to stop hanging out with the same brethren. Some of you all need to listen, and some of that brethren could be CNN or Fox News. It could, be, it could be the podcast you like to listen to. It could be, and it says what? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. If you look at that word discouraged, it means melted. Our hearts have melted because of what everyone else is saying. Discouragement. Discouragement. Go to Psalms 55. And because of what they were receiving and because of what they were hearing, it melted their hearts and it kept them in their tents. And they were meditating more. They were meditating more on what wasn't happening instead of the covenant that they had as God's covenant people. So that's, that's a key to us. We have to stop complaining on where we are and start thinking about the covenant that we have because of Christ Jesus. I have a covenant. And I'm telling you, that first covenant was an amazing covenant. If you look at you look at Deuteronomy, you look at you look at Abraham and how what the everything that Abraham possessed, but yet in Hebrews it tells us that we have a better covenant established upon better promises. So when I start talking about what's not happening, then I'm not focusing on covenant. I'm not focusing on on my identity and who I am now in Christ Jesus and what that purchased for me and what that brought to me as a child of God. I'm telling you, the enemy has a voice. The enemy has a voice and he he uses people to get his, his message across. 
He'll use circumstances to get his message across. Let me get there. Verse 1 says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. That's just another word for my heart cry, my prayer. He says, Attend to me and hear me. Now, this is the psalmist talking to God. He goes, I'm restless in my complaint and I, mo- I-, I moan noisily. <laughs> The psalmist is saying here, he goes, I'm going through stuff, and you know what? I'm not going to be quiet about it. (laughs) But I also want to encourage you, it's okay for you to be real with God. It's okay for you to be real with God. Faith isn't like, faith doesn't say that sickness doesn't exist. Sickness doesn't exist. Sickness doesn't exist. That's stupid. (laughs) Faith says, these are the facts. This this might be be a truth, but Lord, your word is the truth. And your word is a higher form of reality. And I thank you that your word says, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Your, your word says that we should lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Psalms 107, 20 says, you sent your word and healed them and delivered them all their destruction. Psalms 103 says, bless the Lord, all my soul and all that's within me and not forget one of his benefits for he heals me of all, he forgives me of all my iniquities and heals me of all my diseases. He crowns me with loving kindness. So, so the thing is, is faith isn't about telling what doesn't exist. The thing is calling things that be not as though they are, and we do that according to the word. Yeah. That's good That's good. And so here he's crying out and saying, God, I, 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 man, I'm, I'm not going to be silent about this. And he says this, but where did this come from? Voice three said, verse three says, because of the voice of the enemy. It's the voice of the enemy. How, do I t- how can I tell if I'm, what voice I'm listening to? Very simple. Romans chapter eight. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. What voice are you listening to? Because that voice is not bringing life and t- peace to me. And it's probably not God's voice. Now, hear me. That's not to say that you're not going to go through things or we're not going to face things. I'm telling you, there's things that have come against my life in the last 30, 31 years. But when it's when I went to the word, that word is what settled me. That word is what settled me. It was because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, It didn't say because of the oppression of God. It said because of the oppression of the wicked. For they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. Wow, he's having a bad day. (laughs) So I said... This is what he said. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I'd fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I'd wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Wow, he's saying, Lord, if I just have wings, (laughs) get me out of here. Get me out of here. I've got to go. Uh, Get me out of here. I'm going to go. But honestly, how how many times do we want to do that? What's the first thing to do when we have something that comes against us? But you know what? You can't move a mountain if you're running from it. You can't move a mountain if you're running from it. You know what? He didn't even say go around the mountain. 
So the thing is, is we have to, we have to come to this place. And that's, that's, what, that's just humanity. That's just the human nature that's coming out through us in that. But even in the midst of that, and you, you have to understand the whole thing he's writing about here is being offended by someone. You know what? You won't be offended by someone you don't know. You care less because you, you won't see them next week. But if you keep reading, he goes, he goes, it was my brother, it was my equal who I walked hand in hand with. <laughs> Come on. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, help us. Lord, help us. Help us. But then, then he says this, and David wants to get involved. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I've seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night, they, day and night, they go around the walls. And so David, David even had this perception that everyone in the city is talking about it too. I think I said this before, you're really not that important. It's like we're, not everyone's talking about it. It's, it's what you're making out to be in your personal storm you're in. Now, let's not leave David, David there, and I, I need to get into some other things, but, but you have to understand, then David says in verse, verse 16, as for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. There were many against me, and God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old, because they do not change. Therefore, they do not fear God. He gets over to verse 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. So we, so we, we understand what was coming against David was the noise of the enemy. It was the oppression of the wicked. And he was like, I just want to get out of here. Hey, I would just like, hey, Lord, you do something about, destroy them, do something about them. But he comes to this place, God, after me, I trust in you. And you know what he says? In evening, afternoon, and morning. Amen. Amen. So what we, have, what we have to understand is the, the enemy will try to shape our lives by our environment, the things we're going through, all that's taking place. But we have to know who we are. Fear will drive you in the wrong direction. Fear will cause you, fear will keep you from going forward. Fear will keep you from stepping out. But we have to know who we are. We are sons of God. Say, I am a child of God. Mm. Hallelujah. Can we praise him for that? Let's go to Luke, Luke 15. Luke 15. We are going somewhere. That was foundation. Thank you, Father. Let's look in verse one. The title for today is My Three Sons. <laughs> Luke 15, verse one says, then all the tax collectors, which no one like them, we don't like them today either. Sorry if you work for the IRS. My apologies. We love you. Just don't like your job. <laughs> then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him <laughs> to hear him. Everyone needs to hear him. And my heart is that you would hear him through my voice this morning. So the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him 
to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying... So you understand, Jesus here, he's got this audience of all sort of people. It could, it could be like a Sunday morning service. Because, you know, you, you don't know. I mean, you have people that, are, that aren't even in the pool. You have people that are in the shallow end, and you have people in the deep end. You have... You have people here just checking things out. You have people here that are kind of, I'm not sure what's going on here. You have people that had a different maybe denominational background and saying, I probably won't come back to this church. Um, they're a little loud. Um, not sure about the dancing. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, you know. And, you know, uh, you know so you had Pharisees. You had, Sag- you had religious people. You had, you had all sort of people in this, in this audience that were coming to hear him. It's interesting how many times people come to church that aren't really interested in hearing from him. They just want to hear things they agree with. It's interesting how many people, it's interesting how many people come and listen to a message and or critique it. So I'm t- there's fag- Pharisees, <laughs> Sag- there's Pharisees, <laughs> maybe that's a new, a new person, <laughs> Pharisees, there's uh, there are Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, <laughs> man, it's turning red now. <laughs> Help me out, Eric, come on. <laughs> And so you have people, all sorts of people that are in a room and here Jesus is ministering to them and he's hitting every single one with where they are and they cl- complained, complained about what was happening. But yet, you know what? It was the tax collectors and the sinners weren't complaining. It was the religious people. Amen. You know, I've gotten more letters. We get more feedback on our YouTube things from Religious people than we do from people that have no clue. Let me encourage you, don't be that person. Don't be that person. And here they're talk- Jesus is talking to them. And he sa- he's like, sits back, he goes, let me tell you a couple stories. He comes to this first story and um, he says, There was a shepherd, and this shepherd had a hundred sheep. Said he left the 99 to get the one. He left the 99, and it wasn't that the, the 99 didn't matter. The issue was the one was just as important. He died for the whole world. But it wasn't so the world could stay the way the world is. The issue was, there's an, John the Baptist said this. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you just look at that on a surface level, you kind of get lost and it sounds real uh, religious. But when you understand what John the Baptist was saying, he was, getting, he was preparing the way saying there's a new system coming. Repent for the king. The kingdom of God is a system, just like we have this world. There, it's a system. There's systems that are set up that God didn't establish. And so here, John the Baptist is saying, "Hey, repent," meaning change your mind, go 180 degrees a different direction because there's a new system coming. That's that's really what that means. There's a new system coming. Because in that system that they're living in, what with the, with the Pharisees would see, the system would be just leave the one because they deserve it. But yet Jesus saying, hey, say he left the 99 to get the one. And he says he brings the one back. You know what? He didn't kill the one that left. It said he bound up his wounds, threw it all over his shoulder and returned And it said they rejoiced in the fact that the one was found. Amen? 
He gets to another story, and, 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 he, and he talks about this woman that had 10 coins. And each coin in our today's uh, financial figure would be each coin would represent $1,200. So here she's got some she's got some money. She had ten coins. Each one of them in our in our denomination today would be twelve hundred dollars, and she loses one. What would you do if you just all of a sudden misplaced twelve hundred dollars? I mean, maybe you have enough money that you wouldn't miss twelve hundred dollars. But I don't know. I'm going to be looking for twelve hundred dollars. Phelan, would you be looking for twelve hundred dollars? How many people would be looking for $1,200? I, I'd be looking for $1,200. So, so here, the, you know, she gets the broom out. She's sweeping. She's lighting a candle. She's doing everything she can do because she wants her money. Also, understand, this was probably her inheritance. So it even meant more for her. And yet, it talks about the rejoicing of this one that comes back, this rejoicing, that everyone's rejoicing because that which was lost was found. I think I'd rejoice. How about you? Amen. You know, it's interesting. He goes, he goes, just like heaven, when this one soul comes and returns to the Lord, heaven rejoices. Yeah. Amen. Can we rejoice? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your salvation that's come to my life. And then he gets to this third story. He talks about a certain man having two sons. A certain man having two sons. And let's, let's pick this up in verse 11. And then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his lively. He divided to them his livelihood. Say his livelihood. his livelihood. And then it says, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. The word prodigal means wasteful. So now, now if we look at this in our Western understanding, we miss really what's happening here because this is a really big deal. And you have to understand the scribes and the Pharisees that are listening to Jesus understand what he's saying in this story because they can't comprehend it because their mind has been shaped by a lack of a better term, religious tradition. So in a Eastern mindset when this younger, young, not even the older son, the younger son would ask for his father's livelihood, his inheritance. If I went to Paul Bridges and I said, Paul Bridges, I want what's owed to me. If he was from that understanding, he was from that culture at that time, what I would be asking would be, Paul Bridges, you're dead to me. You're saying that your father no longer exists. I want what's mine. The father has two different options here. One, he could, the first thing he could do is he could totally reject and disown the son. Or secondly, he would have to make the choice to suffer loss. You know what? He didn't disown the son. He chose to suffer loss. I mean, think about that. That's, that's the reality of what Jesus is saying to them. That when you ask for the inheritance, he's saying you no longer exist. And so those religious people there, they knew. They knew what Jesus was saying, and they, they had a hard time with it. We know the story. He goes, he goes and it says he wastes all of it. He wastes all of it on, on parting. He wasted it on whatever it might be that day. We know women, we know different things, but he wasted it all. And at the end of wasting it all, then all of a sudden a famine hit. Now he had no resources left. And next thing you know, now he's in a pigsty. 
It says he's, he's now working for a citizen in that country. And when it means a citizen in that country, it's referring to someone that's not of a Jewish descent. Because one, Jewish men wouldn't raise pigs. That was a foreign thing. You, you did not do that. They were unclean animals. And yet you have this Jewish man that left his father and disowned his father, and he's sitting in this place now taking care and living with the pigs. You talk about the bottom of the barrel. And yet all the while he's thinking to himself, how much better it's back at my father's house. How much better it's back. I would have food to eat, and even, even, even my father's servants are taken care of. So all these things are going through his mind and he works and rehearses the story and he's like, like, yeah, if I just go back to my father and, and I, you know, I can just see him rehearsing the story. What could I say? I, what could I do? Yeah, okay. All right, God. I, okay, Father, um, just receive me back and, and you don't need to treat me like a son, but you can treat me like a hired slave. You can treat me like a hired servant. And I think sometimes that's how people that have religious tradition are like, God, don't bless me too much. Don't do too much because, you know, I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm just your, your servant. We all need to serve. That's not the question. But you can, you, can, you can exalt the fact that you're a servant and not understand you were created to be a son. And so he... He makes the trek home and he, and he comes home and, and you have to understand in that society, there was something that the society would do because they didn't live, like in today they call it kibbutz and, and they would live and they would be these villages, you know, just like Hamas attacked, they could attack a kibbutz. So there was people that would live in those communities. They weren't far off homes. They were, they people lived in these things. So everyone knew everyone. So everyone knew that this son left his father. And how much do you think that even the whole community looked down on the father because the father should have stood up and been a stronger man and not given him the money and disowned his son? But yet the father wouldn't. But we know the father, it tells us, it says that he looked off for a long way and he saw his son coming. And let me, let me go back for a second. The community would do something and it would, call, it would, be, it would call, be called a kazaa. And what they do is they would take this pot and when the son would try to come home, they'd break it at his feet and it meant a cutting off, meaning, meaning just like this jar has been in our family, in community, we're gonna break it at your feet and just like this is no longer mine, you're no longer ours. And it was a Jewish tradition that they would do. And, and here, he, so here the story keeps going and, and it says the father, and it says he sees him afar off. That let me, that, what I love about that is he never stopped looking for the son to return home. He never stopped looking for the son. And, and, and he, he comes home and he's, and, 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 and he's, he's, really, he's really in fear. He, because why? Because he's now been shaped by another society. He's been shaped by all these other things. And, and he goes, will I be received? Will I be accepted? Will, 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 they, will he take me back? I don't know, but I'll just, I'll just be a servant because I need food. I need sustenance. I need life. And yet even before he's even finishing his whole spiel in the, in the speech he, reserved, he rehearsed, the father hugs him, puts his arms around him, and he says this. He tells the servant, he, servants, he goes, I want you to go get the best robe. I want you to put a ring on his finger, and I want you to put shoes on his feet. Now, it didn't say just put a robe. It said put the best robe. What, what would that mean? What would that mean? The father is saying, I want you to put my robe on him. The best robe was the father's robe. So when it said put the best robe on it, the father is saying, saying, put my robe on him, put my ring on him, and put my shoes on him. You see, shoes weren't worn by servants. Shoes were only worn by sons. 
Put a robe on him. And this represents righteousness. Put righteousness on him. Because now he is justified. And, and he's just as if he had never left. He's my son. He is put, put my robe on him because it rec represents my righteousness as the father of this house. Put my ring on him. Put, put my ring on him. And that ring represents authority. It represented favor. And it represents a return to dignity. Because that, that ring was the purchasing power that the son would now have that he could purchase anything that the father could purchase because that was the signet ring that let him know what family he was a part of. But the story doesn't end there. There's the second son. Say second son. The second son was the oldest son. And the oldest son was, he was... Um, you could probably call him the Pharisee of the house. And the Pharisee of the house, he, he was out working because that's what you do, you work. And it said he, he, he saw the son come back. He saw, the first, he saw his, his younger brother come back and he had an attitude. Then he hears the fact that he heard the other servants came to him and said, Look, bro, <laughs> he's going to kill the fatted calf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, but the fatted calf, not, not that, that mangy one, but he's going to kill the best one. And for all we know, it could have probably been the brother's calf. I don't know. I, it doesn't say that. Sorry. But <laughs> yeah, maybe the older brother raised that. I don't know. And he's outside and he refuses to come in. Such a passive aggressive move. Well, I'm just going to stay out in here and work. It's, I'm going to stay out here work in the field while they're all partying. I just want to prove on how good of a son I am. And I, I just want to see if anyone notices me. All this stuff I'm doing, all this, all this work I'm doing, all this thing for the Father's house, for my Father's kingdom, all this stuff that I'm doing, I just hope someone sees me. There's two things that we can see just with tradition, even going back to the, the first son we talked about, and, and then the fact that the Father ran to go to the Son. For one, that was a no-no for a man that was over the age of 40. And also, in order to run, they had long tunics on. You, it's hard to run like this. So you'd have to pick it up and you'd have to run. So that was also culturally unacceptable for someone of high class as this man was. But when we look at the, the oldest son, we see the father comes to him also. He comes out of the party. Why is that a big deal? For one, the oldest son, the tradition was the oldest son is the one that would greet the guests. So even he was out of position. And the father had to go out to the other son because the other son wasn't in his position. The oldest son should have been the one throwing the party Instead, he's complaining about the party. So the father comes out to him. So you see, the father runs to one because he was unrighteous, but he ran to the other because he was religious. But either way, the father loves them both. The father tells the oldest one and says, and says everything I have is yours. You could have, you could have killed any man, animal you wanted and you could have had a party with your friends anytime you wanted, but you chose not to. I love the heart of the father because the father runs to the one that's been shaped and hurt by society to let him know he's still a son. And the one that's been all of a sudden molded and shaped by religious tradition, he goes out to that one also and says, hey, you're my son, you have rights. You have rights. But 
the third son. Say the third son. It's the third son. Let's look at verse 22. Let me first say this. The third son. Well, let me say this. <laughs> the third son is the one telling the story. The third son is the one that's telling the story. And I believe the third son is found in verse 22. But the father said to his servant. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus laid down his deity. And it said he became a man, found and fashioned as a man. And it said he became a servant. But the father, verse 22, but the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatty calf here and kill it. The third son is telling the story. Not only that, but I believe the third son is also the servant. And also the third son is also the fatty calf. You see, when Jesus died on the cross for us, and we accepted, not until we accepted and received it, he put, a, he put his best robe on us, the righteousness. He put a ring on our finger. He gave us authority. And he put shoes on our feet. Go to Ephesians 1. You have a time for a couple more scriptures. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. For the sake of time, Thomas, can you put Ephesians 1, 3 through 5 in the uh, message, please? It says, how blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He is the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and he takes us to the high places of blessing in him long before he laid down his earth's foundation. He, this verse, is there another verse? He had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Amen. Let's look at Colossians, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Verse 1 says, If you, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated, 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 sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. See, this is what we have to, what I want you to leave with today. We have to set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Because the things on the earth will try to conform us to a different mold we weren't created for. So here, how do we, how do we continue to go forward and be and grow in the image of Jesus in our personal lives? Is this verse right here. If you being raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's where it starts. Seek the things that are above. 
Seek the things that are above. Seek the things that are above. But how often are we seeking for everything else around us? Seeking, seeking the world, seeking the world's approval, seeking everyone's opinion, seeking all these other things. But yet he tells us here, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Then he says, set your mind on things above. I love the Amplified. It says, set your mind and keep it set. Set your mind and keep it set on things above, not on the things of this world. For you died. You died. It's interesting, it doesn't say that you will die. He said, you died. This is past tense, you died. You died. You, when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, whether you realize it or not, the celebration in heaven was actually your earthly funeral. It was actually your spiritual funeral, that when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, the Bible says, you died. And that celebration was like, good, he's finally dead, yes. Yes, he's finally dead. Now he's alive in the spirit. Now he's a child of God. Now he's a son of God. Now he's born of God. You died. You died. You died. <laughs> that person that doesn't keep his promises, he died. That person that, that, that had the worst mouth, that, 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 could, that talked bad about everyone, that, that he died. The, the one that was constantly in fear about his future, you know what, he died. The one that was, 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 was sick, perverted in his mind, addicted to pornography, you know what, they, he died. He died. He died. But the thing is, is we like to resurrect him. He died. Now get this. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hidden with Christ in God. What I, had, what I have to continue to come to the place to is let Christ out. <laughs> See, because my life is hidden with Christ and God, I just got to let him out. You know, it's like, you know, just let him out because the old man's dead. Let, my life is hidden with Christ and God. You might look to your neighbor and you're like, you know, I, I, God's still working on me. And, uh, you know, there's things that I'm being renewed to and I'm being transformed in. And, you know, but, you know, I'm actually dead of that. But, you know, but ultimately my life is hid with Christ and God. You just can't see Christ fully yet because fully yet. That's why, that's why, Pastor, I, I, I want to be in the word because, because then I start looking more and more like Christ. I, I start acting more and more like Christ. I start living more and more like Christ. I start speaking more and more like Christ. I start loving, 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 loving like Christ. I start, I start responding like Christ. I start doing all those different things. Why? Because my life, I died and now my life is hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. It says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness. And there's a list for each one of these words that we won't go into right now. Evil desires and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of, the, of, because of these things, the wrath of God is the coming upon the sons of disobedience, uh, which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, but now you yourselves, but now you yourselves are to put off. Say, put off. Put off. All these. See, there's things that you got to put off. There's things you got to put off. Even though you're born again, Paul, uh, Paul's saying here, there's some things you got to put off. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to help us and show us the things we need to put off. You're like, you know, it's just time to just take that off. I believe the Holy Spirit is going to wake you up one morning and saying, you, you know what? You just need to put that off. You just need to put that off. See, you, you've heard this message, and, and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is going to say, hey, you need, to, you need to take that off. 
you've been warned. I'm telling you, it's too late. You've heard this message. So, so now, I mean, the Holy Spirit is going to awaken you and you're going to be in the middle. You're going to be in the middle. You might be in the middle of doing something you know you not need to do. And you just say, wait a minute, I got to put you off. I got to put this off. I, I got to. Okay. Man, I, oh man, someone sped that clock up. But now you yourselves are to put off all these wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man, say old man, man. with his deeds. So it's not just putting the old man, but now you got to put the deeds away. But, But it's interesting how so many people want us to accept their deeds. But okay. It's just how I am, you know. You just need to be transformed. That's all. It's not a big deal. No one's judging nobody here. It's just Corinthians tells us that unless a man judge himself. It's not me to judge you. It says unless a man judge himself. You, you, some of you just need to put yourself on trial. If you say, hey, you made Jesus like you're going to heaven, but there's some things you need to judge in your life. And say, you know what? This probably isn't the best thing for me. Put off the old man with his deeds and put on. Say, put on. on. Say, put on the new man. man. Wow. You are good. That's great. Put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We got to put off the old man and we got to put on the new man. But it goes back to the early part of the chapter and how do we do that? Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. See, the enemy is a punk. He, things that, things that didn't tempt you before, Five years from that time, all of a sudden now are a temptation. Why? Because you started giving your affection towards it. What is affection? It's your time. It's your word. It's your money. It's your life. It's all that you are. You start, and, and so little by little, as you give your affection to that, all of a sudden things that, that, that would not trip you up, all of a sudden will now trip you up. Why? Because you didn't set your affection on things above and keep it set. You are a son of God. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you, Father. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more scripture. <laughs> Another scripture. <laughs> Hebrews 10. Let me close with this. And this is, this is going to be your assignment because you are children of God, Right? So I'm going to leave you with your assignment as you leave because, you know, we're, we're talking about in, engage and, and, you know, go have your conversation and you put your ping pong ball in, right? And because this is, this is what we need to embrace and understand. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the, holy, 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 enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. I, I believe that God, in, through this series, that your, your heart is being cleansed from an evil conscience. You know, I started this series talking about sin consciousness, meaning you're more aware, aware of your weaknesses than God's strengths. 
And it said, because of Jesus going to the cross and going to the Father and dying for me, he's a high priest for me, it says, because of that, I can draw near with a, sure, a full assurance of faith. And because of that, my heart can be sprinkled with it from an evil conscience. And her body is washed with pure water. And it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Say, God is faithful. Then it says this, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let us stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So this morning, I've exhorted you the fact that you're a child of God. Secondly, I want to exhort you the fact this scripture actually means to provoke unto love. It means start a love riot. Provoke one another unto love and to good works. I provoke you unto a riot. Not in the riot the way the world would look at a riot, but a riot is an intense display. Provoke one another unto love and a good works. So, so this morning, I provoke you to an ex- to a intense display of love and good works. So as you leave here today, that you were gonna go, go out today with intense love and good works, amen? Because you're a child of God. You're a son of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You received this word today. Amen. Amen.